Hello, it's Kat. Welcome to The Creative Introvert. So before I begin today's episode, I just want to remind you that because it's the month of April, it's my birthday month, and I'll be offering 50% off all astrology readings uh, for the month of April. So if you've been interested in getting a look at your birth chart with me, talking about your career, creativity, and other aspects of life, now's a pretty good time if you book by the end of April 2020. So if you'd like to do that, you can find out more at thecreativeintrovert.com slash astrology. Okay, so on to today's show, which um, all started because of this Dr. Zeus quote. I'm certain somebody told me that his name is Dr. Seuss. Please correct me. Um, I don't really know which one I'm going to decide on yet. But anyway, there's this quote, which is something like, today you are you, that is truer than true. There is no one alive who is youer than you. And I've just always really liked that. And I've been having a kind of conversations with myself and with various friends for a while about what is it that makes us ourselves and how can we be more authentically us? And even hearing that term, it kind of gets banded around a lot, being authentic or being true to you. Um, but without really diving into what you is. Um, so I just thought we could try to explore that today, or at least I could, and maybe you can give me some feedback on what you think about all of this. So the way I started this was looking at the term the self and uh, how that's been described by other people who've gone before me. And most of this episode is going to be me quoting from really smart people and just basically regurgitating it and trying to put it together in a easy to understand and digest and take action on format. Okay. So got to go with, you know, the daddy, Carl Jung, um, who talked a lot about the self. So according to Jung, uh, the self signifies the unification of consciousness and unconsciousness within us. And it basically represents the psyche as a whole. So getting to the self isn't that straightforward. It doesn't kind of come naturally. It's, it's always there, but um, for us to be consciously aware of it or even like parts of it is, is take some work, some, some awareness. Uh, so it's kind of like this process of what Jung described as individuation. Um, which is basically like a life's work. Um, it's the great work, effectively. And it's this idea that you're integrating different parts of your personality. So for Jung, the self was basically encompassing the whole, uh, which acts as a kind of container for all of these other little bits, which we'll get into some of them uh, today. The other thing he said was that in the first half of life, you're in the process of forming your ego and differentiating that from the rest of the world, uh, becoming aware of the contents of your consciousness. So I think this is a lot of, um, you know, taking the Myers-Briggs type, which I guess is based on his work, but um, all of these little tools that we can do and use to become a little bit more self-aware and conscious of like what we are, what we are like, basically. In the second half of life, and we can kind of you know, it's, it's a question like, when is somebody's second half of life? When does that begin? A lot of people think, I guess it's in their 40s. So anyway, the second half of life is a rediscovery of the self. And this is when individuation really kind of kicks off. So this is becoming more aware of all of the other stuff, not just the ego or the persona, um, but all of this other stuff, these complexes that exist in our unconscious. So I'm going to be going into one of these more in depth in today's show, but only one because it's it's a lot. And, you know, I'll grant that I just turned 32. I'm nowhere, hopefully I'm nowhere near <laughs> like the second half of my life. I don't know how long my life will be, but um, arguably I'm not old enough to really speak about individuation and not wise enough yet. Um, maybe never will be. <laughs> so it just take all, all of what I'm saying as a pinch of salt with a pinch of salt know that this is something that I'm learning <clears throat> or trying to learn so in this process of individuation images and that's kind of the easiest way to think about these images emerge and the first one is the shadow um, some people might call this the personal unconscious as well and this is what we'll be looking at much more in today's episode then, then after that, you're going to get the anima or animus, and that's the soul image, um, which I'm wondering if 
that is more close to what we've been talking about as the daimon? This is an interesting question for me. Then you meet the mana figure or the wise old person who represents the collective unconscious. And finally, the self emerges. So, you know, maybe we can start taking on some of those other later stages at some point further down the line. But for now, I'm going to be talking a lot more about the shadow. And remember that this is only one take on it. Just this, this is one line of thought that I've been exploring. Um, and not everyone would agree. A lot of people would think that this is a kind of pointless endeavor anyway, because, you know, if you're like a Buddhist or even a scientist, you might say there is no real self. Um, we're just kind of a collection of impermanent behaviors and mannerisms um, based on past experience. Fair enough. And I do think that there are different ways to just define and think of the self. Um, what's more important, I think, is, you know, you figuring out what that means to you. Uh, but I am going to focus, especially today, on the first image that Jung lays out, which is the shadow. Uh, and partly also because I've been reading a lot of books, which I will put in the show notes at thecreativeintrovert.com slash you, spelt Y-O-U as opposed to just you. Um, and I've been really, really um, fascinated by this idea of the shadow and what it really means to do shadow work. Because you'll find a lot of people talking about, you know, on YouTube, other podcasts talking about doing shadow work. And it's like, the yeah so so I, i'm just trying to dig a little bit deeper into this concept and hopefully get a little bit closer to the idea of you and i'd also really appreciate any input from people who have actually got some jungian knowledge um you know anyone who's actually studied this stuff um academically or just in more detail than i have i'm really interested in your opinion so let me know uh comment below or if you're watching this on youtube um, and if you're listening to the podcast, maybe just drop me an email. Hello at thecreativeintrovert.com. Okay, so in order to kind of talk about this, we do need to start by talking about the ego. And again, there are different ways of looking at this. Uh, some are more positive than others. I'm not an ego hater. A lot of people are just like, death to the ego. That's all you need to do. Just kill it. Uh, and I think it's obviously really useful and it's it's what helps us be in this world. But it's also really difficult and I know that the challenges that the ego brings along with it I know them all too well so it's something to watch carefully um, you might already be able to guess kind of what the ego means it's basically the I in I am it's, it's it is you in a way um, an image that helped me is this image of a circle being kind of our whole self our whole psyche with the dot in the middle, which actually looks like the sun symbol in astrology. It is the sun symbol in astrology, the sun glyph. Um, and that, that dot in the middle is the ego. It's like the point of focus. When you look around a room and you're focusing on something, um, that's one way of thinking about it. It doesn't mean that the rest of the room doesn't exist, but it's kind of blurry and out of sight. And, you know, if you were to sort of just like, you know, watch this video and then try to um, imagine what's happening at the side of the room. Well, you can't, it's really hard to see it unless you turn your head and, and then your ego follows. <laughs> so anyway, it, it's basically the thing that organizes our thoughts, feelings, senses, and intuition, and has access to our memory. Um, it's also how we respond to the external world. So as far as I know, that would be introversion, extroversion, feeling, thinking, and so on. So in a way, your Myers-Briggs type is basically the type of ego you have. Um, and just, it's becoming clear to me, I mean, it definitely wasn't when I started the creative introvert, but you know, that's not you, that's not all of you. I'm not just an introvert, basically. Um, and a lot of people do spend most of their life thinking that that is the case, that they equal their characteristics or ego traits. So. The next thing to look at is the persona. And the way I see this is, if I'm getting this right, I think it's like a division of the ego. Um, if the ego is the corporation of you, uh, the persona is the PR team. It's the face that you present to the world. Um, persona, the word actually means mask, and it is your mask. It's what you try to present or at least you know, you know, want to present to the world. And the ego is the driving force behind it. 
but sometimes the mask slips and you will see somebody's ego. Sometimes my mask slips and you'll be like, ah, it's all your ego. <laughs> so, so the mask isn't necessarily a bad thing that we need to tear off and just, you know, be without it. It is actually really helpful in how we interact in the world. Um, we probably wouldn't get on very well with each other if all of us took off our masks and, you know, unapologetically, you know, let our egos out. That ne wouldn't necessarily um, be good or let everything else that's in our, um, you know, the contents of our psyche out. That would be pretty terrifying. Um, but it can be quite stifling, um, especially if you identify too much with it, like thinking I am my success at work or I am how my boss sees me or I am the likes that I get on this post. And keep in mind that we don't necessarily um, create our masks ourselves. This is also like a societal effort. We're picking stuff up um, based on our upbringing and just what situation we get plonked in um, when we get born. Uh, so we kind of have this mask thrust upon us effectively. Okay, so now we're going to get into the my like current pet project, the shadow. So this is by far the hardest to love aspect of us. Um, it's kind of by definition, that's what it is. And I did touch on this briefly in a series that I did back in 2017. Um, and I'm hoping to do a much better job now. It was an okay series, but um, we just skimmed on the surface of this. And I can't remember where I've read this term. I'm going to do my best to cite everyone and everything that I reference. But, um, but the, the way to best think about this is as a child, we form and like, you know, throughout life, we're forming our New Year's resolution self. That kind of um, that's what I'm, you know, wanting to be. That's what I'm shooting for. Um, but every time we attempt to take a, a step closer to that, um, we start burying other parts of ourselves that we don't like we don't want to own or have um other people see and all of those things is what forms the shadow so it's all of those qualities that don't fit our own self-image our idea of our ideal self uh, things like rudeness and selfishness there's a damn good reason we don't show those things because people generally wouldn't like us very much if that's all we were doing and it's also worth noting that it isn't quite necessary for us to have a shadow um this was just a quote that i read this is an online one so i'm going to put this link in the show notes without a well-developed shadow side a person can easily become shallow and extremely preoccupied with the opinions of others just a walking persona just as conflict is necessary to advancing the plot of any good novel light and dark are necessary to our personal growth and this is an idea that it's just so important with this um to do any kind of what they call shadow work, uh, trying to kind of um, excavate what the shadow is for you, um, we have to kind of accept that that light and darkness being vital and just necessarily true. So something else is that we don't just kind of stifle our own shadow qualities. Um, we also project our own shadow traits onto others. Uh, so you've probably seen a lot of people do this. You know, somebody comments on somebody's behavior and you're like oh my god they don't see that they're doing that themselves this happens all the time i catch myself doing it sometimes i don't catch all the other times because that's my shadow it's, it's hard to see um but but that's a big part of this is the projection um aspect and basically this the whole secret is that the ego doesn't want to admit to us those traits also exist in you and the reason they're triggering you so much is because they're part of your shadow the thing that you're trying to repress so like try so hard to repress and this is the thing that really uh, intrigued me when I read it or found out about it and felt it to be true is we don't just project the things that we uh don't like and we don't just stick stuff that we don't like in the shadow bag we also project things that we admire onto others um, amplifying them in a kind of ludicrous way and those are actually also parts of ourselves just parts that we're not um, ready or willing to admit or own so when we hear ourselves saying things like oh i could never possibly be like that or um you know just really um aggrandizing somebody else 
that's also part of the shadow. It's um, what somebody referred to as the golden shadow. And the trick here is really trying to balance our shadow with our persona, um, or at least that's what I'm trying to do. Um, just becoming aware of these parts of my small self so that I can discern them from the whole self. That's kind of the idea. And my hope is that by acknowledging these inner demons, I can try to transform them into something like a helpful ally, something that's going to actually help me. And maybe um, I can use this energy uh, for something creative. And just to summarize all of that. So the ego is what we are and what we know about consciously. The persona is what we would like to be and how we wish to be seen by the world. And the shadow is that part of us that we fail to see or uh, have not yet got to know. Oh, and don't go thinking that you can't cast a shadow. So if any of you are just thinking, well, just don't have one. Like it's, it's very, very unlikely. Um, I don't even know if it's possible. And that's really not the aim either. The aim isn't just to be like, well, now I have no shadow. Now I'm all light. Um, the key is living with that light and the darkness that is inevitably in us. Uh, the Hindu gods Brahma, Shiva and Vishnu illustrate this perfectly. Brahma creates, Shiva destroys, and Vishnu sits in the middle, keeping the opposites together. It can also be seen in the Christian cross. It's a kind of like seesaw with a central axis reaching up to heaven and much further down into hell. Jung said, there is no light without shadow and no psychic wholeness without imperfection. William Blake saw the great energetic opportunity in the shadow. He said, when we can face our inner heaven and our inner hell, this is the highest form of creativity. And we see it in the lives of great artists and creatives. Schumann, Picasso, Goya, the dark sides of these creatives came part and parcel with their greatness. Um, so I prefer to see it as a way of restoring the balance of the universe rather than us having some kind of terrible debt to pay. It's just we're trying to restore some balance. And I find it helpful to imagine this seesaw with the ego on one side and the shadow on the other. And all we're trying to do here is bring the ego down a little bit and raise the shadow up and create that balance where maybe the self can arise in the middle. So how does the shadow begin to form? I think this is kind of interesting to look at and especially coming back to our main topic, which is, you know, how do you figure out who your true self is? You know, what are these parts that you're disowning? So it's helpful to know that that the things in this shadow bag um, aren't just the things that we don't like about others, we don't like about ourselves. There are also qualities that we like, maybe even love, that we've been giving away to other people um, and not owning. And, and this, I think, maybe makes the appeal of shadow work a little bit um, you know, more appealing because that way you're not just expecting to find things that you really find repulsive and that society finds repulsive, but you might actually find some things out about yourself that even though you haven't been owning them uh, are actually really valuable. Jack Sanford said that in his view, there are two shadows. One is the dark side of the ego, which is carefully hidden from itself and which the ego will not acknowledge unless forced to by life's difficulties. And two, that which has been repressed in us less to interfere with our egocentricity and however devilish it may seem, is basically connected to the self. So in that way, the shadow is actually more helpful to us than the ego, especially when it comes to figuring out who the hell we are. And, you know, it can become this direct route to the self just because some of those traits are things that we've been rejecting and projecting um, actually belong to the self. Marie-Louise von Franz remarked, who I've been loving recently, uh, why do we always assume projection is bad? If we didn't project, we might never connect with the world at all. Women sometimes complain that a man often takes his ideal feminine side and projects it onto a woman. But if he didn't, how could he get out of his mother's house or his bachelor room? The issue is not so much that we do project, but it's how long we actually keep the projections there. Projection without a personal contact is dangerous. Thousands, even millions of American men projected their internal feminine onto Marilyn Monroe. If a million men do that and leave it there, it's likely that she will die. She died. 
Projection without personal contact can damage the person receiving them. So again, it's really important, not just for yourself, but for other people um, to recognize the utility in our shadow side and actually try to take back some of those projections, the, you know, the good ones and the bad ones. So I've mentioned a couple of times already this idea of a shadow bag. And the person I got that idea from was Robert Bly, who speaks about this bag in his book called The Little Book of the Shadow, which I highly recommend. He says, behind us, we have an invisible bag and the part of us our parents don't like. We, to keep our parents' love, put in the bag. By the time we go to school, our bag is quite large. Then our teachers have their say. Good children don't get angry over such little things. So we take our anger and put it in the bag. By the time my brother and I were 12, we were known as the nice Bly boys. Our bags were already a mile long. So different cultures and different families are going to fill their bags with different things. Um, I know that certain characteristics in my house were discouraged and some were encouraged. Um, like for the love of God, I was not allowed to ask about sex or our anatomy. Um, I, it was not encouraged to ask for what you want because that would mean you're greedy or spoiled. And being intelligent was the thing that meant that you were worthy of love. No offense to my family. They did the best they could. <laughs> um, the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde comes up a lot in books about the shadow. Uh, and if you, you know, I don't even think I need to explain the story, but uh, that was actually a dream that came to Robert Louis St Stevenson. And it really expresses the shadow side of us very well. And what happens if the bag remains sealed for too long? You know, the more um, Jekyll tried to kind of be good and religious, uh, the more Hyde would kind of rebel. Uh, and back to the bag thing, I just thought I'd tell you, I really wanted to call this episode um, Letting the Cat Out of the Bag. No? Okay. Uh, I think How to Be You Than You is a bit better. So this idea also suggests that there are some really important things in our shadow uh, that aren't bad or wrong, that actually might be beneficial for us to take on. Things like repressed confidence that you may at one point have been told was too cocky uh, or arrogant, but that same stuff is actually really helpful when it comes to um, your own self-belief, um, self-confidence and how you show up in the world. And, you know, you might be admiring other people for their confidence, but not realizing that it's actually something that does exist in a repressed form in you. So what happens when we don't feel authentic you know why not just go by in life um, and continue with our bags it sounds like a lot of work to have to excavate so much stuff it, it, that's in them well the thing about this is that when we aren't our authentic, authentic selves one we become less empowered so the problem here is not owning our shadow is that it keeps its grip on us and it can take us away from taking positive steps to better ourselves. According to Marianne Williamson, that's the shadow's classic repertoire. Have another drink, it's no big deal. Never forget how much that hurt. The earth will be okay, don't worry. And it takes a lot of courage to actually say no to these shadow voices and accept our power and commit to something higher. Two, we may lose confidence. So when we stay scared of our shadow, we stay small. And we don't give ourselves the opportunity to grow in confidence. Uh, we remain doubtful about our true abilities. And we remain fearful that somebody might, God forbid, see our shadow side. Quote from the I Ching. It's only when we have the courage to face things exactly as they are without self-deception or illusion that a light will develop out of the events by which the path to, to success may be recognised. We become distorted. So these shadow projections don't just exist in our imagination. We actually seem to act out other people's projections without even realizing it. And I think it might be, you know, part of the self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, you know, somebody expects us to act in a certain way. Um, we find ourselves doing that, uh, whether we want to or not. So this is another danger. We're also kind of like affecting other people in that sense. And speaking of other people, we waste a lot of energy judging other people. So when we're so critical about ourselves, we end up throwing our shadow around and judging others. 
and I've been really trying to do less of this uh, and it's way harder than I thought so as soon as I kind of became more consciously aware of this um, my instinct was you know me judgy never uh, how wrong I was and the first step I took to noticing this was when I was speaking to uh, a friend about somebody else negatively um, we, we just, we, it was a stranger basically I didn't even know the other person it was just you know an instinct uh, an instinctual reaction um, but thankfully like I did become aware of what I was saying and I was just like I don't know where that came from it's not even true I'm kind of saying it to either entertain the person I'm speaking to or make myself feel better in some way um, both so I can't say that I'm completely judgment free at this point but it's definitely something that I'm becoming more aware of uh, which is helpful and it's worth remembering like what we miss when we are busy just judging the shitty side of ourselves and others. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from my astrology teacher, Achuta Bhavadas, says, reality is singing these tremendous songs of beauty all the time, but we can't hear them when we judge. And similarly, we can't see the beauty in ourselves if we're too busy judging others the whole time. So what happens when we can actually absorb our shadow or eat our shadow as I think it was Bly who said something like that um, and actually become you are the new well for, for a start you become more solid kind of like a teacher who has absorbed their shadow they can keep a class calm and attentive without too much force of discipline you probably had these teachers at school some would actually be able to somehow yield this um, amazing um, calm and, and direct our attention and, and some teachers, no matter how angry they got or how passive they were, just nothing worked. So a teacher who has a lot of shadow stuff to deal with, you know, they're the ones who basically can do all they want, can yell and threaten uh, and won't actually have any impact on, on others. The shadow, according to Bly, gives you a feeling of natural authority without the authority of uh, being demanded. Another quality that comes is a certain kind of humour uh lincoln ha had it apparently so apparently someone asked lincoln if he could find him a good government job and lincoln said i have very little influence in this administration so it's kind of that kind of humble sense of humor and when a woman met him on the train and told him he was one of the ugliest men she'd ever seen he didn't become offended what should i do about that he asked the woman she replied well you could stay home and he would tell that story himself Bly also says that a person who has eaten his shadow spreads calmness and shows more grief than anger. If the, if the ancients were right that darkness contains intelligence and nourishment and even information, then the person who has eaten some of his or her shadow is more energetic as well as more intelligent. And I'll add that the person who's eaten their shadow is in a much, much better position to create from. Imagine the kind of work you can make when you're not held back by some bullshit. You'll stop creating work that looks a certain way just because you think that that's what it's meant to look like. That's what the flavor of the month is. You'll stop comparing yourself to others, or at least do it a whole lot less. And you won't get so crippled by comparisonitis. You'll start making work that you truly love. The kind of work that actually resonates with other people too, because it's coming from a place within you that's much deeper. A kind of place that you might not even have realized you had access to. And a kind of place that resonates because it's something foundational and we will share it. So here are some approaches to letting the you out of the bag. Also, I mean, as much as I love Robert Bly, he did also say that people under 35 cannot teach other people to eat their shadow. Um, sorry about that. So maybe this is all bullshit, but uh, I have 10 ideas and um, I'm going to do myself to follow these myself and maybe we can go on this journey together. And if you're older than 35, tell me what I'm doing wrong. So number one, be willing. I'm going to start with a quote from uh, Marianne Williamson again. When we're lost in the darkness, our greatest power lies in calling on the illuminator, whose task is to separate truth from illusion. We do this through prayer and through willingness. I'm willing to see this differently is a sentence that gives the illuminator permission to enter in our thought system and lead us from insanity back to truth. That sounds very religious, but I do think she has a point about um just being willing 
Uh, it's it's the first step with, I guess, anything. It's you know, if you're not willing to see your flaws or your uh, light sides, what can you do? And of course, this can be a very bumpy ride. Uh, so being willing actually takes a hell of a lot of courage. Uh, it's kind of like a prerequisite. And uh, so something I kind of paraphrased from Robert Bly's book. To break the projection, so this is when we're projecting our shadow qualities onto others, we have to go through some rattling, some troublesome inconsistency. So when you see that your wife, who's been carrying your inner witch, doesn't act like a witch all the time, or when your husband, who's been carrying out your negative patriarch, doesn't act like a tyrant all the time. And the same thing happens to presidents, actors, countries. Uh, and, and this can be quite unsettling when we realize, oh, I, I wasn't seeing them clearly. The next thing that happens is that we use our rational mind to repair the tear in reality, or our, our reality anyway. Uh, and we start justifying the behavior of, let's say, the guru in the ashram who's been sleeping around and abusing his power, saying, oh, he's just teaching us a lesson with his crazy wisdom. And then if we can move past that stage of kind of denial, we can actually see the person behind the mask we projected onto them. We see our shadow side. We see ourselves in the projection. And the feeling of this happening is incredibly humbling, terrifyingly so. So not only do we see that the negative is also part of us, but we can see that we've given the positive part of us away and still this has to be reclaimed. Uh, and this is because when we give away one part of ourselves, it carries both a positive and a negative trait within it. Uh, and I'll get more into those kind of polarities or paradoxes in a bit. Bly says that our friends play crucial roles in this stage. The sense of diminishment sets up strange situations. If we tell a friend of our feelings, it's important that the friend does not try to cheer us up at this point. So they might try to help us deny it so we can go back to thinking we can be who we were before. Uh, and this would be taking a step backwards. And finally, we can retrieve that part of ourselves that we had up until now sh uh, shoved in the bag. And I just wanted to tell you about a recent experience, which I did have with um, basically what Bly is describing here. Um, and without airing my dirty laundry and tell you, telling you all the shameful details, let's say that I was hating on somebody um, for basically asking for what she wanted. And uh, just for being quite bold, uh, you know, objectively bold in the asking. And the way I saw that was just like, oh my God, I can't believe how rude or consider and you can see it now like it elicits a lot of like emotion in me still it's charged that's how you know it's a shadow thing um and i was telling another friend about this because i knew it wasn't right i knew i was doing some weird shit um and they helped me through it in a very gentle roundabout way um which is their approach but it, it worked very well and i realized that this was all pointing to something that i was you know all my life trying to squish down um, and I think, you know, to say it mildly, it's a kind of competitive side in me. It's this, exactly what I saw this person do in a way, or at least what was behind it, it for that person. Uh, that's also part of me. Uh, but yeah, and, and it's interesting to reflect on that conversation with a friend afterwards where I came into this realization. Um, and we both agreed that two, three years ago, uh, maybe even a year ago, I wouldn't have been able to handle that, um, that realization. It would have been too destructive for my ego, or I would have just like battered it away. Uh, you know, I'd have stayed in that mode of projection. I've even said to that same friend in the past, like, I'm not competitive, you know, good as gold. Uh, so yeah, reclaiming your shadow side only comes, you know, I've been shown uh, when you're ready for it. So these little traits are going to reveal themselves slowly over time. Uh, and it is unpredictable, but your first step is basically being willing. Okay, my next tip is to notice where you shine. Marianne Williamson tells a story about being at her therapist's office and discussing why she hates herself. She said that it's because she's so negative. And the therapist suggests that she tried naming all of the things that she's grateful for and this had a powerful effect. She realized that the problem was not just the presence of her negativity, but the absence of her positivity. 
because as soon as her mind filled with gratitude, the shadow trait of self-hatred could no longer exist. In the presence of love, fear is gone. So that's this idea, which feels quite Marianne Williamson-y, of like, if we just kind of turn on the light, the darkness goes away. Um, this might not always be the case and it might not always work, but it's an interesting idea, I think. Uh, and I really wanted to give you, you know, you're probably sick of hearing it, but I just love it so much. It is not our light, not our darkness that frightens us. And we know this is true because, you know, we, we hear this quote and we hear Marion Williamson say it and it's like, oh, it's true. Um, and bizarre as it might seem, our shadow is our comfort zone. And as long as we are being weak, we don't have any responsibility for actually bearing the, the lightness. And uh, I'll just let you listen to Marianne Williamson say it. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It's our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? But actually, who are you not to be? So some questions to ask yourself to uncover that light. What did you love as a child? What leaves you feeling energized? Where do you get into a state of flow? What conversations do you love to have? What do other people praise or compliment you for? And all of these questions and many more can be the kinds of things that point you to your true self. Though I would say that it's tempting to just kind of see and list out the stuff that your ego or your persona wants the world to see. Um, but remember, this is, this is just for you. No one has to see this list. Um, try to be as honest as you can when answering those questions. And use your feelings as a guide. Uh, the ego is having to do the heavy lifting now, um, and it's not really designed for this, but it does need to comply. So work with it. Try to catch it when it tries to fool you with its stories, when it tries to disown these traits and say they're silly or something that you know society doesn't need. These are all things to be owned, whether your ego thinks them to be too light or too dark. For example, I really enjoy walking in nature, um, but what I enjoy more is telling people that I enjoy walking in nature. <laughs> and, you know, I don't know, it makes me seem like really cool and earthy, but I actually much prefer to sit in my pajamas and read a book. Things like that, like admitting what I actually prefer over something else. It's not like I don't like walking in nature, but as um, some of my friends will know, um, you know, I'll get tired quickly and you know, I'll fall over and stuff. I'm just not really designed for it. But admitting that to myself um, to begin with was actually quite difficult because my shadow was doing such a good job of not being the person who spends, who wants to spend the afternoon in bed or the whole day in bed. My next tip is to notice what annoys or disgusts you. So we've looked at the kind of light stuff. Let's look at the not so nice stuff. And whatever this reaction is that you have, you know, negative reaction, if it's exaggerated, if it's something that you hate, not just dis like dislike, um, then, then that's when you know it's a shadow trait. Because honestly, like it's, it's fair enough to dislike certain things. And there are a lot of things about people that we're like, oh yeah, that's, you know, I, I don't like that trait about them particularly, but it does, also doesn't bother me. That's not really a shadow thing. If it's something that you uh, kind of can't stand, that you kind of get, like, I'll do this comic rage thing. And it's, it's most of those are shadow traits that I'm criticizing. So it's also helpful to notice those extreme negative emotions, um, not just kind of directed at anyone or anything in particular, but let's say um, you're feeling Envy or resentment, those are two of the big red flags for me. I know that uh, when those are triggered, you can be sure that, you know, the shadow is, is activated. 
let's say envy might be triggered when you're scrolling through Instagram. Resentment might be triggered when you're answering a client email with an emphatic yes, even though you mean no. Shame is another big one. So without having to dig into the root cause of all of these emotions, I know that they are completely disconnected from my true self. So, you know, these are things that we've had, that have had a grip on us since childhood, I imagine. And as much as I try to repress them, they're powerful uh, and they're much older than I am. But the upside is that if I do try to acknowledge them, they seem to back off. So the task here is really just identifying where your own red flags get triggered. Pay attention to your emotions. Following a path of attention, one notices where the anger goes and precisely whom we become obsessed with. That's another quote from Robert Bly. Next, embrace the paradox. So I said I'd come back to this. This was one of the most interesting parts of this, I felt, in my <laughs> research. So much of our self-squishing comes from our inability to hold paradox. And, you know, you've probably seen the yin-yang symbol before, this uh, white tear shape and the black tear shape and the dot of each in each other. And this is just a really important symbol for many reasons, but it's probably the best thing icon that we have to symbolize the, the likeness and the sameness and the, uh, the wholeness when we have light and dark together. And what we tend to do is cluster our traits together so that we isolate them and so that they stand opposed to each other. We kind of split the symbol in two, you know, like white stay over there, black stay over there. Hey, get that dot out of each other. You know, we really want everything to be um, really uh, separate. For example, if I feel like I'm independent and that's like something that I like about myself and my persona wants that to be the case, then I can't possibly ask for help because that would mean that I'm dependent. Uh, or for example, if I'm a leader, if I step into a leadership role, then I would automatically be a bitch because that gets grouped into that category. And my friend posted something on Facebook recently, which did a really fantastic job of showing me how we can do this for basically everything, everything that we are getting a bit polarized on. How can we work through them and see uh, the, the both and? So again, if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. Um, I'll read out some of them. So it's, it's basically a list of two columns. Uh, on one side, it's saying, I can be strong. And on the other side, and still. And still be soft. Or I can be direct and still be kind. I can be creative and still need inspiration. So it's just being able to sit with these paradoxes that we might have created and know that they're not contradictions so a paradox is not a contradiction uh, this was a quote that really helped me contradiction is barren and destructive yet paradox is creative it is a powerful embracing of reality it's the both and instead of the either or robert a johnson says reality or god is not found in any single view of life no matter how attractive that view may be but in the wholeness of our own experience my next tip is to notice slips of the mum, I mean tongue. I couldn't really think of a really good uh, slip there. But basically, the idea here is that our mouths and our bodies give us away. So notice when you find yourself frowning at somebody or squinting at somebody. Um, you know, why did, why did you do that? Uh, something in you is giving your shadow away. It's what I love about Zoom. You can actually watch yourself back and see what ridiculous faces you start to pull. Um, I remember having a, a dinner with a lovely family that I stayed with last year. I don't even know if this is a good example, but basically what I intended as a compliment about the food was um, I said something like, oh, that chicken soup is really special. And to me, like, I, I genuinely think that that, like my conscious mind is like, I meant that as a compliment. But however it came out, um, the guy who made it seemed genuinely offended. And like everyone at the table was like, special? why did you call it special? Like it just, it felt like a weird um, adjective to use. And I'm still not sure to this day, you know, what I really meant. Like I, I was enjoying it that, I mean, I honestly was enjoying the food. Um, but equally I did have some beef with the guy who, who made it. So I wonder if unconsciously just in the way I expressed it, 
and the choice of that kind of strange adjective, um, I was letting my shadow out a little bit. So the point here is not to sweep these blurts or missteps under the rug. Uh, also not to like kick ourselves for them, but just to sit with them and ask ourselves honestly, like what was I trying to communicate there? Um, what was my shadow trying to say? Next, notice your dreams. Our dreams are filled with shadow characters and they usually are gonna be uh, a person of the same sex as you. Um, but again, we're basically just looking for exaggerated traits and emotions that they elicit in you. And we react to these shadow figures, usually with some of those things like fear or disgust, things that we, uh, that are, you know, dead giveaways. Um, or we'll feel like particularly superior to them um, or want to run away from them. And the best thing to do, and just so you know, I don't know much about this. This is just what I'm trying to do myself, um, is to take note of all your dreams and keeping a, a dream journal, which I know is like easier said than done. Uh, one thing that I do know is if I at least attempt to do this, very quickly it gets easier. So I'll actually start remembering my dreams more. I'll start remembering to write them down more because that's the hardest bit. Um, and, and it is interesting and dreams do end up getting, I think, a lot um, more richer and detailed when you make a practice of this. Uh, and other things happen then throughout the day, which kind of, oh yeah, that's what that dream thing was about. So the next step from that would be working possibly with active imagination with these characters, but maybe that's a whole other track that we can talk about on a future episode. My next tip is to ask for feedback from others. This is arguably one of the most powerful ones, but probably the one that we're all going to avoid the most, because who wants somebody to tell you like, that's your shadow, by the way, I can see it. <laughs> um, so and obviously the people who can do this for you are, you know, exclusively going to be the people closest to you. Don't accept somebody who barely knows you to tell you what your shadow is. They probably won't. Um, and the people who are closest to you will give you a really great, accurate reading, but equally you'll be most likely to want to disagree. Yeah. So it's, it's hard. Um, I think this would also be a practice of just kind of, okay, I'm going to sit with that. You know, I'm not going to decide yet how accurate they are. Cause you know, they, it's true that they could be projecting stuff onto you as well. And then you're seeing their shadow. So which is which it's something to untangle. Um, but I think the important thing is just to watch your own response, uh, to the criticism you receive, you know, the more uh, emotionally triggering it is probably the more close to the truth it is as well. Uh, and also importantly, reflect on the positive feedback too. Um, stuff that you can't own up to. You'll think like, why on earth do they see that in me? Like, where did that come from? Um, yeah, these are all things to be ref uh, reflected on. Next tip is to act, but don't act it out. I'm not telling you to, you know, figure out your shadow traits and then become that shadow monster. Like, that's not a good idea. That's not what I don't think anyone is teaching but acting it out or symbolically expressing it in some way uh, is really helpful. It basically provides it with a voice. So, you know, it might be a ritual or a play or a ceremony. Of course, making art is, is a wonderful expression. And according to, oh shoot, where did I read this? Yeah, this is um, Robert Anton, Anton Johnson again. So according to him, the unconscious cannot tell the difference between a real act and a symbolic one. Okay, I'll take his word for it. Uh, this means that we can aspire to beauty and goodness and pay out that darkness in a symbolic way. So there might be part of you that fears giving your shadow an outlet um, in case it like wins over you and, you know, uh, kind of over consumes you in a way. He said... Medieval heroes had to slay their dragons. Modern heroes have to take their dragons back home to integrate them into their personality. I thought that was really interesting. Um, on the retreat I went to in January, uh, the guy who ran it, Adam Summer, said something about, it really stuck with me, about the aim isn't to slay our dragons. I can't remember what else he said, but I, I think this idea of, you know, maybe in the past or in like these stories, you know, they they were um, these heroes. They were slaying the dragons, but that was symbolic. 
that's not really what we're doing here. This is still symbolic stuff. And um, the aim isn't to, to kill anything. It's to um, integrate it. And dragons have been a theme for me recently. So I've actually started painting them myself. Uh, here's a weird example. And this is because, you know, painting and drawing, they're probably the most natural expressions for me. Uh, I also use active imagination a little bit. So working with these images um, and in a way just, you know, seeing what they do, talking to them, uh, watching them. And it's been weird, but like very useful. So the, these are all things to look into. Johnson also talks about the powerful symbolism of mandalas, not mandalas, mandalas. Uh, a mandala is an almond shaped segment that is made when you get two circles overlapping. And you can see it in the stone circles at Chalice Well in Glastonbury, which I visited a couple of years ago. And that shape in the middle um, that looks like an almond. Uh, well, it makes sense because the word in Italian for almond is mandola. Italians, you know what I'm talking about. Good stories are also mandolas. They, they speak of the opposites overlapping and kind of finding um, union. I like to think that a story is based on the triumph of good over evil, but the deeper truth is that good and evil are superseded when the two become one. I also think this is why um, I really fell in love with Studio Ghibli films, um, because if you ever, ever notice that all the characters have less distinct good and bad sides, you know, I say like good and bad in quotes, but really like I remember watching Spirited Away again recently and that was the first film that I'd ever seen where I left kind of conf like in wonder, but confused because all of the Disney films I'd ever seen, it was like, you know, Ursula is, is clearly a baddie, Ariel is clearly a goodie, and, and all of these really clear distinctions between good and bad. But in this film, there was such a blurry line in pretty much all of the characters. Um, yeah, I just found that interesting. And you can also kind of represent this um, maybe in your home. So South American Carinderos, who are a kind of mixture between like shaman and Catholic priest, um, their, their table, their mesa, uh, their mesa is basically an altar where they say mass for healing, um, for the healing of their patients. And they divide this altar into three distinct sections. The right is made up of inspiring elements such as a statue of a saint, a flower, a magic talisman. And the left contains very dark and forbidding elements such as weapons, knives, and other elements of destruction. And the space between these two opposing elements is a place of healing. And the message here is basically that our healing is what proceeds from that overlap uh, that we call good and evil, light and dark. And it's not that the light element alone does the healing um, or that the dark gets completely displaced. It's a place where the light and dark begin to touch, and that's where the miracles arise. And that middle place is the mandala. Um, you can also dance this out, make music, like I said, make art. Uh, you can talk about it. Uh, my conversations with the uh, aforementioned friend um, and other close friends are always guaranteed mandalas. Uh, each episode of The Seeker and the Skeptic, my other podcast, I believe, is a mandala. Not that one of us light is light and one of us is dark, but one of us is a seeker and one of us is a skeptic. And I think what we get from that meeting is, is really great. I also love this example of the shadow in the Zen tradition. Uh, so apparently as like a kind of ritual meal, uh, one will take a few grains of the Buddha's rice and put them on the end of a spatula to offer the evil spirits for their, you know, pleasure. So then the idea is that the servers come by and take a few grains off the end of that spatula and offer them to a plant or an animal. And this, in doing this, this is kind of returning them to the cycle of life. So this is a way of consciously acknowledging the evil spirits or the shadow to feed them the best food and yet not to feed them too much, just a few grains. And the idea is that later in the day, if you come across one of these evil spirits, you can say, I already fed you. I don't need to feed you again. 
So in the Buddhist tradition, it's believed that there is a realm of hungry ghosts with huge appetites and throats like the size of a needle. So they're never satisfied. Like the shadow, they have a ravenous appetite. But by feeding it in small, regular amounts, the shadow doesn't need to take on a devouring attitude. Again, this is kind of like interesting, symbolic ways of thinking about this stuff. And we know that we can't eliminate the realm of hungry ghosts. Uh, we know that they exist. So we kind of have to take care of them so that the effect of their grumbling will be less. And it's the same with the shadow. Next tip, communicate with your daimon. So if you couldn't tell, we're getting progressively weirder with these tips. Uh, the daimon I've spoken about before, uh, which I'll put a link to in the show notes, um, or if you just search for the episode, meet your daimon, you'll find it. And I'm still in the process myself of working out what the diamond means for me and, you know, what, what the hell is it? Uh, so you're getting all of this in real time and it, it, it does develop too. So my current understanding is that our personal diamond, and we all have one, um, it's effectively the same thing as the Holy Guardian Angel or the HGA, if you're into the Crowley stuff. And it lives in a kind of liminal realm between the material world and the world of God, spirit, creation, and, you know, everything that we came from. So the other way of framing this is that the daimon lives in the imagination, um, or maybe what Jung would call the unconscious. But whatever view of reality you have, I think the daimon is a really, really useful thing to try to communicate with. Uh, I went to a day of lectures recently held by the Temenos Academy. Um, some really, really super cool, I guess it was a mixture between philosophy, uh, spirituality and psychology. Uh, and if you're in the UK, um, definitely check them out. And I'll put a link to the videos of the talks in the show notes at thecreativeintrovert.com slash U, Y-O-U. There was a lot of talk about angels, uh, a lot of talk about creativity and imagination. And I came away with a lot of notes, but one of my biggest ones was that our imagination is a very important and powerful faculty that we have um, and even if you think yours is crap oh I'm not imaginative um, well you do have one I just think it takes a bit of practice to use it sometimes and one idea is that the diamond can show us who or what we're meant to be like it knows this blueprint of us and you know some kind of ideal version of us but it's not necessarily going to be what society wants of us. And it might be more, you know, in the truest sense, what God wants for us and whatever word you'd like to replace for that. So I probably lost some of you there, but it even works if you exchange God with nature. Like how are we naturally meant to be if you stripped away all of the crap and social conditioning we've been brought up with? Socrates is a great example of somebody who spoke of a personal diamond. And he said apparently this diamond would guide him and tell him at least what not to do. Uh, you can also think about this as your intuition, um, but I'm actually on the team that thinks intuition is maybe too impersonal now and that maybe the diamond um, feels a little bit more real and uh, something that you can actually talk to and listen to more importantly. So yeah, this was a big takeaway for me that we don't actually have to have like any kind of fancy ritual um, to make contact with our daimon, though some people do, and if you're a magician, more power to you. But my main and most simple tip is just listen. So what do we need to do in order to listen? Well, in practical terms, we need to get quiet. And this is a great, uh, I guess, for me, it's a great motivation to meditate, but it's also uh, a great way to meditate, you know, even if you're skeptical, just listening. Um, active listening, they call it. Some some people call it they. Uh, I don't know who that is. And it's just a really great way to um, stay open and and present without getting too far down that train of thinking, which which is inevitably going to happen when we're meditating. But as soon as you realise that ah, that's thinking, that's not listening, uh, that can help. So maybe search for some open awareness meditations or active listening. Um, or if you find that, you know, just what I'm, what I said there made sense, then give it a go. Uh, probably didn't. And maybe just kind of keep holding 
the question in your head. Like, what would it be like right now to hear my daimon? Might be very scary. <laughs> I've got more tips and thoughts about the diamond in that episode. And I've also been exploring uh, what the birth chart in astrology can say about what our diamond is. So feel free to check out my readings at thecreativeintrovert.com slash astrology too. But generally from that day of talks and from the reading that I've done is that the diamond is something that wants to be heard, whatever, whatever it is. So just know that you're not bugging it by, well, you're probably not, I don't know, I can't speak for it. You probably aren't bugging it by requesting to hear from it. It probably appreciates it. And I'd go as far to say that all of the traits and complexes that we've discussed so far are all things that are desperate to be heard and acknowledged. Um, and I'm saying that based on what I've read, but also my own personal experience of, you know, how things start to shift every time I agree to hear them out. And final tip, last but not least, astrology. Um, I think we should start a, a tip jar for every time I end an episode with astrology. But So one thing uh, an astrologer might look at is where your ascendant is, what sign that's in. So if you um, were born when Taurus was rising, that would be your rising sign. And I'm just going to read out a little bit of a explanation of this, um, how this might look from Liz Green. She says, for example, if you have Taurus on the ascendant and are typical of that sign, you may despise people who are not overt and out in the open. Taurus often dislikes those who seem, uh, seem to be secretive or manipulative, who aren't straightforward, or who complicate things and create crises when there should be peace and quiet. But at the same time, Taurus is actually fascinated with people who have a mystery about them and who are not easily read and who seem to have insights into human nature in a magical way. It's the same figure, but if you don't like it, then it's evil or slippery or vicious. And if you do like it, then it's deep and profound and strong. Both sides are wrapped up in this Scorpio descendant. So if you look at a birth chart and you look at what sign is opposite Taurus, that's Scorpio. And you can do this with all of the signs. So whatever your rising sign is, where your ascendant is, and where your descendant is, might say something about um, what kind of you naturally think is a good trait and what you naturally um, move away from. And I'm saying naturally, but this can also point to, you know, what are we putting in the shadow? That could be the sign that is opposite to us. So that's one example, but it's important to mention that this is just a psychological take on astrology and it's really helpful, but it can only take us so far. What's been even more helpful to me in the grand scheme of a what I'm learning about astrology um, is the teachers who have told me the following. Number one, the chart doesn't just tell you about your psychological traits um, or your personality. Two, the chart doesn't even just tell you about you. In fact, most of it is other people in your life, other things and other events. And three, and I think the most important, is you are not your chart. You know, it's the map, not the territory. So I tend to see that you know, wonderful example from Liz Green as as a layer that's helpful. Um, but we can also look much deeper and just from a kind of broader perspective, which is our birth chart isn't us, similar to our ego, our persona, that's not just us. And there is a lot else that's happening. And I just found astrology to be the most helpful tool in seeing that truth. You know, not just to know it intellectually or in theory, but to actually feel that um, when you see things playing out the way the planets kind of said they would or looked as if they would you know when you start to see your whole life playing out um in this way you do start questioning how much free will you have how much how much is determined um, and i don't think there's like um a real hard number to each of those things but if you really sit with that idea i think you're forced to detach a little bit uh, and realize that there's a lot more going on around you uh, and it also stops looking so much like chaos. Uh, it starts looking like part of this grand ordered plan. And that plan, in that plan, is you. And so the leap we have to make is realizing that there is a you to witness this madness. And for it to witness it, it kind of has to be separate from it. And, you know, thinking about all of this makes my head hurt somewhat. Um, 
and maybe the good old weather analogy is going to help with this one so let's say you read the weather report this morning and it said there was going to be a 90 percent chance of rain so you bring your umbrella it helps whether or not it does end up raining that day it probably helps you know um you might have been a little bit upset to begin with to figure out that it was going to be raining that day but you don't necessarily identify with the rain you don't just like lose all hope because it's raining um you do your best you bring an umbrella so in that sense we do have some choices you have the choice to bring your umbrella to stay at home and cry to go stand in the rain <laughs> like you have lots of different choices in that sense but you don't control the rain so basically if you'd like your own weather report or astrology report uh you can do that um just check out the services that i'm offering at the creativeintrovert.com slash astrology and make the most of that 50 percent discount through the month of april so some quick final thoughts if you really commit to this idea um this practice um this process of being you than you you might start to find that the lines between what you thought was you and the you that you're getting to know become a bit more blurry and a bit more um, a bit less distinct so in terms of the idea of having no self well i do think there's truth to be found in that idea uh, but i also don't think it's that helpful in the material realm we sort of need our egos in order to function um, to feed ourselves and to support ourselves and you know if you really want to check out that's up to you but i think if we're going to be living in this material world we also need to get to know or try to know our shadows and our projections um it's useful it's it's a mission and it's one that i've just kind of started to chip away at uh and i expect i'll be on this mission my whole life and you know hopefully just keeping in mind that the goal here is not to get anything or to achieve anything but just to uncover what's already there uh the you that is underneath it all so i hope that was acceptable and it made some kind of sense and is some of, of some use to you if you like this video please click like if you're watching this on youtube uh, please subscribe if you'd like to um, you can also do that with the podcast much obliged and it would also be really great if you're listening to the podcast to leave a review on the apple podcast store uh, that way other creative introverts can find it too and if you share this on instagram thank you very much please tag me at creative intro and i'll be sure to shout you out and you can also find me on twitter at creative intro too and if you really really like the show and you'd like to come on board join the league of creative introverts and interact with me and my creative community you can do that by becoming a patreon so head over to patreon.com slash creative intro and for as little as a dollar you can sign up support the show and join the league we'd love to have you thanks for listening and catch you next week Bye.